So how do you identify intraoperative bronchospasm? So intraoperative bronchospasm, how we will identify? There would be some typical clinical features which we have to see and we have to specially see the capno, change in the graph of the capno. So intraoperative bronchospasm, identification, wheezing on the chest auscultation, if we will auscultate, we would hear wheezing sound, change in the end tidal carbon dioxide. There would be upsloping, right, upsloping of the plateau phase, right. Then there would be, there was the possibility of a severely decreased ETCO2 or absence ETCO2 in complete obstruction, in complete absolute bronchospasm. So in partial bronchospasm, there would be upsloping of the plateau and in absolute bronchospasm due to air trapping the ETCO2 will decrease and may become completely flat, okay. There would be a decreased tidal volume, high inspiratory pressure and decreased oxygen saturation. So patient initially the ETCO2 will increase, the graph upsloping graph will change, the saturation of the patient will decrease, the airway pressure would increase and the tidal volume which is delivered would be decreased. And when I will see all these clinical features, I will auscultate my patient. When I will auscultate, I would hear V's. So this could be, this could be diagnostic of bronchospasm. But there are a number of intraop conditions which can mimic bronchospasm. So we need to rule out those intraop conditions. So what are the intraop conditions mimicking the bronchospasm as a differential diagnosis? Endotracheal bronchial intubation. The tube has gone into one of the bronchus. That will also present in the same way. ETCO2 will increase, the saturation will decrease, and upsloping of the plateau phase. So there would be how will I will distinguish it from regular bronchospasm? There are number of intraop condition which mimic bronchospasm. So whenever we are getting these clinical features, we need to rule out those differential diagnosis as well. The first is endobronchial intubation. In endobronchial intubation, when the tube goes into one of the bronchus, we would get the shock fin pattern of the ETCO2, there would be decrease in saturation, there would be increase in airway pressure. So all these clinical features, we would get there also. So when I will auscultate, in bronchospasm, we have a bilateral decrease in air entry and V's, but in endobronchial intubation, decreased breath sound on one side, usually on left, because the tube mostly goes into right side and a deep endotracheal tube, right? We will then we will diagnose endobronchial intubation. Then pneumothorax, intraop pneumothorax also presents with increased airway pressure. Decreased, it will also present with desaturation, increased airway pressure, right? But ETCO2 changes will not be there. Initially, there would be, there could be a little increase in ETCO2, but after, let's say, uh, uh, in long term, there would be decrease in it in ETCO2 because of the hemodynamic imbalance caused by pneumothorax. How we will diagnose it? We will diagnose by sudden increase in the airway pressure more and more compared to bronchospasm, a sudden high increase in airway pressure and decreased breath sound unilaterally. So decreased breath sound on one side, asymmetric chest rise and particularly if high airway pressure has been uh, suddenly peak in high airway pressure has been achieved, then it is most probably pneumothorax. Then pulmonary edema, how we will differentiate pulmonary edema from bronchospasm? In pulmonary edema, Pink frothy sputums would be seen, uh, secretions would be seen in ET tube. And on auscultation, the crackles, we can ask, we can hear the crackles. Then kinked or obstructed ET, ET tube, the tube has got kinked in that case. When we will try to do the suctioning, the suction catheter will not go, right? So, and again, there would be a bilateral decrease in air entry, even in ET tube obstruction decrease in saturation and upsloping of the plateau of the of the ETCO2. So most of lot of clinical features would be same, airway pressure will also increase. How will distinguish? Simply by putting a suction catheter, if it is not going, then mostly there is a possibility that obstruction has happened in the ET2. Okay, next question. How will you manage bronchospasm? Well, management of bronchospasm depends upon the <coughs> level of bronchospasm. 
and depends upon let's say we start with initial therapy and then we escalate the therapy if we have a refractory bronchospasm so let's see how we start managing the bronchospasm first whenever bronchospasm happen desaturation happens first we have to increase the oxygen co concentration fio2 of the patient so when bronchospasm is suspected the initial management is administration of 100% of oxygen and take the ventilation in your hand that will give you lot of idea right mild bronchospasm is commonly treated just by deepening our anesthesia if i am giving sevoflurane i increase the dose of sevoflurane i increase give a bolus of propofol very good bronchodilator so just deepen the plane of anesthesia now <coughs> bolus of propo or ketamine or by deepening the level of inhaled anesthetic now patient with bronchospasm that persist after deepening we would treat by saba that is short acting beta 2 agonist so normally we give 2 to 4 puffs but here i will give 4 to 8 puffs because lot of the drug gets uh remains in the et tube only gets uh, deposited in the et tube only so we have to give more puffs so short acting beta 2 agonist so we will give rapidly acting short acting beta 2 agonist like albuterol through a nebulizer or through meter dose inhaler which is attached to via et tube with an adapter 8 to 10 puffs 8 to 10 puffs because lot of medications condense in the et tube keep it in mind not only 2 to 4 puffs which we normally give okay if this is also not relieving this is also not relieving the bronchospasm then what other medication you can use the examiner can ask so deepening the plane of anesthesia giving a bronchodilator is not relieving bronchospasm what other drugs you can give so we can use anticholinergic we can give glycoprolate 3.2 microgram per kg or 0.2 mg in adult or atropine 0.4 mg in adult iv or ipratropium 500 microgram through nebulizer or 4 to 8 puff through meter dose inhaler they have bronchodilatory property so we can use a anti cholinergic when compared with atropine and glycoprolate produces compared to atropine the glycoprolate produces a longer duration bron bronchodilatation that is more than 4 hours versus 3 to 4 hours produced by atropine so definitely bronchodil i mean uh, like your uh, glycoprolate is preferred it causes less increase in heart rate compared to atropine it is preferred but the thing is that both atropine or glycoprolate the bronchodilatory property takes little time to achieve so we have to give it along with saba so we give a short acting beta 2 agonist and along with we, this we give your atropine so onset takes 20 to 30 minutes so anticholinergic should be combined with more rapidly acting treatment like albuterol that is short acting beta 2 agonist then we can use epinephrine adrenaline adrenaline a very good because of its <coughs> beta 2 agonist property it is a very good bronchodilator so for refractory bronchospasm epinephrine is in operating room is given in iv bolus of 10 to 50 microgram 10 to 50 microgram bolus which can be given or continuous infusion at the rate 2 to 10 microgram per minute so this can also act as a very good bronchodilator in refractory bronchospasm we can use magnesium sulfate it's a very good bronchodilator and very good stabilizer of rhythm of the patient so in case we cannot use adrenaline arrhythmia etc is in the patient we can use magnesium sulfate we give a bolus dose of 2 g iv over 20 minutes followed by right <coughs> uh, uh let's say infusion dose and studies have shown that it is very good in preventing the acute bronchospasm so its use has been supported in acute exacerbation of asthma right so just remember when you are giving magnesium sulfate magnesium sulfate can cause sedation and also cause skeletal muscle relaxation it can potentiate the neuromuscular blocker as well so you have to know when you are using it under general anesthesia along with your neuromuscular blocker plus it's a bronco a vasodilator also so let if patient is hemodynamic imbalance it can further cause decrease in blood pressure so we have to choose it carefully so depending upon the condition of the patient we can use anticholinergic or we can use adrenaline or we can use magnesium sulfate there are some other therapies also which we can give but which has not been shown a proven benefit is your <coughs> nitroglycerin and heliox but there is one more drug which we can use is glucocorticosteroid 
high dose of glucocorticosteroids that is hydrocortisone 100 mg iv or methyl prednisolone 60 to 80 mg iv will be effective for 4 to 6 hours and should be combined with rapidly acting medication right perioperative steroids have not shown to increase the surgical complication remember again and again i am seeing saying if we want a bronchodilatation immediately oral steroids or iv steroids so my patient in trop i have to give iv steroids along with short acting beta agonist this also causes a very good bronchodilatation now iv steroid has not increased post op complication in the patient so we can use it now other lesser known therapies not proven therapies is use of nitroglycerin nitroglycerin is known to cause bronchodilatation but you have to use it very carefully because it's a vasodilator right so it can cause a direct smooth muscle relaxation so yes uh, <coughs> studies have shown that and nitroglycerin can cause bronchodilatation heliox helium plus oxygen now if patient saturation is not picking up refractory bronchospasm complete kind of obstruction a very narrow passage then heliox can be used for delivering oxygen this will not increase the fio2 but it can help in delivering oxygen to the patient so heliox only provide the inspired oxygen concentration fio2 of 21 to 30% and does not reverse bronchospasm but it's a temporary measure which helps just in giving oxygen to the patient so heliox that is <coughs> helium plus oxygen in which helium 70 oxygen 30 or helium 60 oxygen 40 combination can be used it has a brown color cylinder brown color cylinder and this has been used in patient with bronchial asthma for delivering oxygen so it does not give a very high fio2 does not treat bronchospasm just help in giving oxygen to the patient when it is difficult to give because of bronchospasm because pure oxygen has high resist will cause high resistance because of its high viscosity okay